All right, I am glad to be here this morning, and I've got good news for you. I've got about two hours worth of things I want to share, <laughs> but I'm going to try to bring it into about 35, 40 minutes, so you have to put your listening ears in high gear. I had a man tell me one time when I was, after I got through speaking, he said, if you'd slow down, we could hear you. I said, if we slow down, we wouldn't get through. So uh, I don't have time to slow down. So I just want you to listen. Now, this morning, I want to talk to you about your legacy. Your legacy. We're talking about legacy, and I want to talk about your legacy. And let me tell you about uh, your legacy. It's composed of five things really or five things about it number one it's eternal number two it's spiritual number three it's glorious number four it's personal and number five now listen to me closely number five your legacy revolves around one thing and one thing only and that's soul winning ecclesiastes 3 11 the Bible says that God has put eternity in the heart of mankind. Folks, God put eternity in our hearts. Why? Because he wants us to focus on eternity. Folks, everything you see in this world is temporary. It won't be here long. If you are a billionaire, you're going to die. You may die a billionaire, but you're going to leave it all behind. And your wife's Next husband's going to spend it all. <laughs> Everything on this world. The glory of man, the Bible says, it's like the, the flower. But when the heat rises, the flower wilts and falls off. The glory of man. The greatest men who've ever lived in the eyes of mankind, <laughs> their glory is gone because they're dead and gone. And so uh, your legacy revolves around soul winning, we must focus on eternity. Now, uh, I want to tell you something real quickly. I want you to go home. Don't do it now. Please don't do it now. But after you get home, I want you to Google, I got off at George Street. I got off at George Street. I watched that again last night. Years ago, we used to, we had copies of that, and we sent it out to people when it was sent them books. It's one of the most glorious uh, soul winning testimonies you'll ever hear. This man by the name of Mr. Genor, G-E-N-O-R, lived in Sydney, Australia. After he got saved, he made a commitment to God to witness to 10 people every day. He did that for over 40 years. He never saw a single soul come to Christ. He never even heard of a single soul he had witnessed to come to Christ. And folk, two weeks before he died, <laughs> He heard a wonderful, wonderful story of the effect of his witnessing for 40 years to 10 people a day. That's about 150,000 people and never saw a single person come to Christ. Please go home and Google, I got off at George Street. It'll really bless your heart. It's about an eight-minute video, and, and you'll be blessed. And I don't have time to share it this morning, or I probably would. Now, we've got a couple of scriptures I want to start out with this morning. And the first one is found in Proverbs chapter 11 in verse 30. And this verse, I've known it nearly all of my life. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that one of the souls is wise. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. I wish I had 30 minutes just to talk to you about what that means. But I did not understand what that means till just a few years ago, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, but I do now. I always focus on he that one of souls is wise. And then in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3, the Bible says uh, that uh, they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. So listen to me closely. Here's what the Bible says. Those who are wise win souls. And number two, he says, they that are wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. Could that be the sun? <laughs> and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Folks, your legacy 
is eternal. It's spiritually, it's spiritually, and it's wrapped around winning souls to Christ. Now, statistics tell us that only about 95%, about 5% of Christians ever win a soul to Christ. Some say it's as low as 3%. Those who name the name of Christ, about 95% never ever win a soul to Christ. So what kind of legacy are they going to have? What kind of legacy are you going to have? But I've got some good news for you. Before this message is over today, you're going to understand that you can shine as a brightness of the firm of ever and ever also without personally winning a single soul. Mr. Ginnard didn't win a single soul. At least he knew about. But I'm going to show you how you can do that because this is about your legacy. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about my story because I couldn't, I couldn't share with you what I'm going to share about our ministry without sharing my, my story. When God saved me, I was, uh, and I still am, I was very shy. I've already told you this. I, I probably wouldn't even be married today if Sue hadn't shaken me down and caught me and, uh, because I couldn't even ask a girl for a date. I was just too shy. I just, I just was. And that was just my personality. And so telling people about Jesus it just was, was, was difficult. And the Lord called me to preach, and I ran for a long time because I'd say, God, I can't get up in front of people and talk. I can't do that. I was just too shy. Listen, when I went to school, we rode the school bus, and I got me a library book, and I would read on the way to school on the way home. <laughs> One time, some of the guys, they wanted to hook me up with a girl. <laughs> uh, that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> I was reading I felt more comfortable with a book in my hand than I had a girl by my side. You know what I mean? I was just shy. Not that I didn't like girls. I was just shy. And so listen, uh, here's my story. Uh, God called me to preach, and finally after running for a long time, I finally said, okay, God, I'll do it. And, uh, and then not long after that, I got drafted. And as a matter of fact, I was going to Louisiana College, a Southern Baptist school here in Louisiana. And... Uh, and I got drafted in the midst of all of that and, uh, and ended up going to Vietnam. But anyway, I grew up in church, uh, made a profession of faith when I was 10 years old uh, and went to church every Sunday. I was just regular until God called me to preach and I quit going to church so I'd have an excuse, you know. I got me a job working on Sunday so I'd have an excuse not going to church because I didn't want God dealing with me. And finally I said, God, I'll do it. I went to church the next Sunday and I told my pastor, I said, God called me to preach. He said, Lee, why don't you go home and pray about that? Because <laughs> it's been a while since I've been in church. I was running from the Lord. You know what I mean? So anyway, I got down into Key West, and Sue and I got into a church down there that was a soul in church. I had buddies in, you know, Key West a military town. We had some of all kinds down there. And I had one, some buddies, especially one that was an Air Force guy. He was bringing people to church every Sunday. He won the cross that week. And boy, my heart just began to yearn to win souls. And I'd go out soul winning with some of the guys, and, and I never said anything. I can remember going and standing on the porch and as, as somebody else would be talking to, to the person there, and my knees would be knocking. I, I mean, I can remember that. I was just too scared to say a word about anything about Jesus. I was just shy. Matter of fact, I went and talked to the pastor. I said, I'm not sure I'm saved because I wasn't winning souls. Uh, he, he felt sure I was saved. But uh, anyway... We had a book salesman come into the house on a Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock. I had never won a soul. I, I prayed all afternoon before he came. I told Sue, I said, don't even cook lunch for me. Uh, I'm going to fast and pray, and I, I want to witness this guy. I never had witnessed anybody before. And he came. He knocked on the door, opened the door, and, and folks listened to me closely. Here, here's a guy had long hair down to his shoulders, had great old big blue sunglasses on. And when I saw that, my heart just sunk, and I silently said to God, God, why did you send me a hippie? for the first person to witness to. He came in and shared his book thing, and we didn't have money to buy any books, but, uh, uh, but I didn't say anything about Jesus. Uh, you know, I just couldn't, I couldn't get anything out. The sun was shining, a beautiful day, and all of a sudden, you through the window, you can see it started raining. Sun shining, it's raining. So he stays a little longer. God was giving me another opportunity. And folks, I couldn't tell you to this day what I said but when I got through talking about Jesus, big old tears running down his face. He prayed and asked the Lord to save him, and I've never been the same since. Amen. After that, I started going down on Duval Street. 
Main Street, downtown Key West, and I'd witness to people, just stop strangers and tell them about Jesus. One night I was down there witnessing to people, and a young man came along. I'm, I'm 20 years old at the time. I'm in pretty good shape. I had just got out of basic training a few, a few months before, a few weeks before, and I was in pretty good shape. And this young guy comes along. He was probably two or three years older than me. He was a shrimper. I get to talk to him about the Lord, and all of a sudden he just starts, he takes off and runs away from me. I guess he just got under conviction. Well, I didn't have any better sense. I just took off after him. I chased him down and caught him. <laughs> and I kept telling him about Jesus. He prayed and asked the Lord to save him. Came to church with him the next Sunday and got baptized. I won a black soldier to the Lord down there. And uh, I took the Sunday to, to church with him the next Sunday. And he came down the aisle and told Brother Wright, he, you know, he'd gotten saved, won't get baptized. And, and, and when, when after that happened, I'm, I'm getting to thinking, I've never seen a black person in this church before. But we're talking about 1969. Things were different back there in the now. You understand what I'm saying? So I, later I went to the pastor. I said, Brother Wright, I said, I wasn't this guy to the Lord. It had to make me a difference if he was black or not. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and he came and wanted to get baptized. I said, did I mess up? He said, Lee, if you went to somebody that's purple polka dotted, just bring them on. I, I, didn't, I didn't know any difference. Folk, I, people are people. I want to see them get saved. But God changed my life in Key West, Florida to become a soul winner. Well, let's just fast forward a little bit. And uh, uh, I got here to uh, Westlake, pastor in Westwood Baptist Church. And we had a guy there named Paul. He got saved while I was there. He had a twin sister named Betty. And Paul said, Brother Lee, would you help me pray for Betty? And so every morning at 5 o'clock, we met at our little prayer chapel there at Westwood, and we prayed for an hour for Betty and her, and her family. We did that every working day, Monday through Friday, for a long, long time. Five to six, we prayed for Betty. Well, nothing seemed to be happening. Now, folk, Betty did get saved. Now, she, she died a while back, and I preached at her funeral. But, uh, but she did get saved. But I began to pray and say, God, I know prayer is the key to winning people, but something's not working here. Show me how to do this. And God began to reveal to me the principles in the yellow book and show me how to, how to, pray, how to pray for the lost. Well, uh, a lot of people, have, they read the first sentence in the book that says, if we don't pray for lost people, they won't get saved. And I've had more people ask me about that than everything else put together. But I want you to understand, folks, this is a truth you need to understand. So I'm going to read you four quotes this morning. I've got two pages, but I'm not going to read but two but four quotes. But I want you to hear that other people have said the same things. Charles Spurgeon, known as the Prince of Preachers, he said, uh, if sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish... Let them perish with our arms about their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. And then he says, whether we like it or not, pray, uh, asking is uh, the uh, law of the kingdom. He said, if you may have everything by asking and nothing without asking, I beg you to see how vital prayer is. Folks, if we don't pray for lost people, we're not going to get saved. Anybody ever heard of Charles Stanley? Hear what Charles Stanley said. He said, uh, we have only one weapon. It is not preaching, teaching, singing, or organizing. It is the Word of God brought against Satan's lies through prayer. Now listen to this. If we don't pray, we save, serve no purpose in God's framework of eternity. John Wesley, founder of the, of the Methodist Church, he said, God's do, God does nothing but an answer to prayer. And even those who have been saved without praying for it themselves which is exceedingly rare, were not without the prayers of others. Listen to Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray said, Oh, when will Christians learn the great truth that what God in heaven desires to do requires prayer on earth as its indispensable condition? As we realize this, we shall see that intercession is the chief element in the conversion of souls. All of our efforts are vain without the power of the Holy Spirit given in answer to prayer. Folks, if we don't pray for lost people, they're not going to be saved. So anyway, God led me to write this book, and when I, when I read it, uh, I mean, when I was writing it, several miracles happened in the writing of it. I don't have time to tell you about that this morning. Uh, but uh, but God, began to, God began to speak to me, and, and he said, I want this book in the hands of millions of people. 
Well, folks, it took me months and months to get to a place where I could believe that because I'm saying to God, God, if this was Adrian Rogers or Charles Stanley or Billy Graham, I can understand how to get the hands of millions of people, but nobody knows my name. How are we going to get in the hands of millions of people? <laughs> well, I was leaving God out of the equation, you understand? You and God is a majority. Me and God is a majority. And now we've had over a million of those books printed. It's printed in at least 33 languages. I, I don't remember how, I don't know how many for sure. We got about 30 something on the table out there. Go by and look at them after you, when you leave here today. It tells you the name of the language and uh, the country it's from and how many millions of people speak that language. And uh, we've got a couple of them, Mandarin and uh, German. It's been translated and, and they can download off the internet, but we hadn't had hard copies printed yet. At least we haven't. Somebody may have printed some that we don't know about, but, uh, but you know, we hadn't had them printed. And uh, anyway, God, God began to speak to me. So let me tell you the value of ramus today. A rhema is a word that God speaks to you. Matthew 4, 4, the Lord says, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word, and the word there is rhema, that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now there's two words in the New Testament for, for word. One is rhema, and the other is logos. The Logos is the written book. The Rhema is the spoken word, the word that God speaks to you. So I want to share with you some Rhemas that God gave me and some Rhemas that God has given to other people that shared with me concerning uh, this ministry. In uh, July of 2001, this has been over 21 years ago, during an all-night prayer meeting with me and some other pastors, we were over in Lake Charles at one of their churches. God spoke to me about midnight and he said, uh, I've released the harvest into your hands. I didn't know what he was talking about. I thought he was talking about revival coming to Calcasieu Parish. That's what we were meeting and praying about, revival coming to Calcasieu Parish. But later I come to realize that's what he was talking about, the yellow book, the principles in the yellow book, I've released the harvest into your hands. And I wish I had time this morning just to, to tell you a bunch of stories. I don't have time to tell you many, but I want to tell you, I want to tell you some. But right now we're talking about Ramus. I was in, uh, Evan, I believe it was in Evansville, Indiana. I was sharing this with you many years ago. And, and a guy came up to me after I got through. And he said, Lee, when you stood up and started speaking, he said, I had a vision of you as God's shepherd. He said, there were so many sheep around you and following you, you couldn't even see the ground. I was, uh, I was in uh, Huntington, West Virginia at a large church of God in uh, October of 2010. And I was sharing this material. I was there for two nights. Uh, several pastors had come together from the tri-state area, uh, West Virginia, Ohio, and Kentucky. They all come to kind of together right there around Huntington. And so several pastors had come together to pray for revival from the tri-state area. And this guy had, this pastor had heard me speak in another church, and he wanted me to come and share the material. So I was there for two nights. I shared the first night, and then came back from the second night, and this guy comes up to me, and I never met him before. I didn't know who he was. And he said, uh, he said, Lee, after you shared last night, he said, I prayed. I said, Lord, how many souls does he have to his credit through the yellow book? And he said, the Lord said, two million. He said, I didn't want to tell you that until I prayed some more. He said, I went home and prayed some more. He said, this time God said two million and counting. And I said, well, uh, would you mind coming up here and, and share that with some of these pastors? There were several pastors standing around the, the altar. And so he came up and shared with them the same thing. He went back and sat down. And one of the pastors said, Lee, this guy's a prophet, said he's very accurate. When he tells you something, it's true. God reveals things to him. So he told me we'd had two million saved. Well, I was there uh, uh, 13 months later uh, in the same church doing another meeting. And uh, this guy, Gary, that wasn't his church, but I let him know I was going to be there. He came. And uh, he sat on about the second or third pew right in front of the, the pulpit. And I just told how when I came last year, he said we had two million saved. He said, it's two and a half million now. So that means we had about a half million people saved during that 13 month period. Well, I was back up in that area doing meetings uh, in February of 13, which is like 14 months later. And, uh, and I prayed while I was up there. I said, Lord, show Gary how many folks we've had saved now. And uh, we had become good friends, and uh, he, would, he would invite me to stay with him when I was up there doing meetings in the area. So I would stay with him and his wife in their home. And when I got to their home, we talked for a little bit, and he said, Lee, I was praying for you this morning, he said, and uh, this big number three came up before me. He said, I didn't know what it meant. I said, Lord, uh, I know this is for Lee. I'm praying for Lee, uh, but I don't know what that three means. He said, 
he said, don't worry about it. Lee knows what it means. Well, I knew what it meant. It meant three million. I said, Lord, show him how many we've had saved. So, folks, that means for about two or three years in a row there, we were having about a half a million people saved every year. Well, this was in February of 13, and I was going down uh, to Galax, Virginia, had some meetings there, and then from there I was going on down into North Carolina to Billy Graham's place because there was a, a leader of the, of a, of, of the a whole denomination. Uh, they have a, a meeting every two years, uh, like a national meeting. They have people coming from all over the world and, and the country, and he invited me to come and share this material at their meeting for the whole denomination. And uh, so while I was in Galax, Gary called me and he said, Brother Lee said, uh, he said, I've been praying for you. He said, and I saw this big banner. It just said champion. And I know it was for you, but I, I don't know what it meant. I don't know what that means, champion. And well, I don't know what it meant either. And so I left Galax. I was there a little while, and I left to go down to, to North Carolina to Billy Graham's place. And about the time I got down there, uh, my phone rang. It was Gary. He said, Brother Lee, I know what champion means. It means soul winner. You're the champion soul winner. Now, folks, listen to me closely. Please, please, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not speaking this out of pride. I'm just telling you what God has done. And, and, and I believe with all of my heart, here's what Spurgeon said. Spurgeon said, when God has a job to do, he calls a man to do it. And if you read the Old Testament especially and the New Testament, you'll find that happening over and over and over again. He chose Abraham to be the father of Jewish people. He chose David to be the king of Israel. In the New Testament, the same thing. He chose Paul and Barnabas to go to certain places. And so he always does that. And, folks, God has chosen me to write the book on praying and effect for the lost because if people don't get prayed for, they don't get saved. And here's what the Bible says. God works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. His good pleasure, he's not willing that any should perish. It's for everybody to be saved. And... I, and he's the one that put the desire in my heart to win souls in the first place. So I didn't have anything to do with it. It was all God's doing. You understand what I'm saying? And when I wrote the book, I said, God, I don't know how to get started. I tried to get two other people to write it for me. I just sat there with a pen in my hand and some paper in front of me, and I just sat there and waited. And after a while, I just started writing. After I finished that paragraph, I just sat there and wait. After a while, I start writing again. When I finished that chapter, I said, okay, God, I don't know how to start the second chapter. And I just sat there and wait, and after a while, I get starting writing. The whole thing was of God. It wasn't of me. So please, please don't. This, I'm not speaking out of pride this morning. I'm not bragging this morning. I'm just telling you that God raised me up to do this, and, uh, and, and, and he's blessed it. So anyway, uh, this, is, uh, this is how I, I kind of figure that uh, uh, we were having a half million of people say because this prophet was telling me what was, what was going on there. Well, I don't have time to read this, this next one. It's like two pages. There's a guy in Virginia, and here's the way he starts this off. He says, uh, let me be like Andy here and put on my glasses where I can see this smaller right. And when I write, I write big enough I can see it. He says, I was praying on Sunday morning, September the 17th, 2017, when I saw a vision of Lee Thomas's ministry. This ministry is, was a large uh, Combine. Now, this guy got a, an agriculture degree from, uh, I think, from Virginia Tech, and he worked uh, for, I think, for Virginia Tech and their agriculture program for the rest of his life. He just retired a couple of years ago. He's my age. And so he knows all about harvesting and farming. He said, uh, Lee's been was like a large combine busy harvesting wheat in a field that stretched to the horizon. This combine was filling large trucks with wheat. And uh, there was a long line of trucks waiting to be filled. These trucks were transporting the harvest of PEL ministries from the fields of the world to the Heavenly Father. Now listen to this. I'm just reading two paragraphs here. He said, each grain of wheat represents someone's soul. If you assume that one pound of wheat consists of approximately 14,000 seeds, he knows all this because he's an agriculture expert, and multiply that by 60 pounds in a bushel, uh, one bushel of wheat contains 840,000 souls or seeds. Wheat yields vary from field to field and year to year, but a good wheat yield in this area is 80 bushels per acre. So 80 bushels per acre multiplied by 840,000 seeds per bushel equals 67,200,000 seeds per acre. 
If you drive one mile, harvesting a 35-foot wide swath with this combine, you have harvested 4.24 acres or 284,928,000 seeds. And the field stretch as far as you see. Drive, brother, drive. I think it was last year, about the time I was having trouble with my heart and had to go get a, another pacemaker, I was up here at the Monday night prayer meeting and Eric prayed over me. And folks, here's what he said. He said, the Lord has revealed that for the next decade, you're going to have a double harvest. Eric Stevens, one of our own, not somebody you don't know, a double harvest for the next decade. But well, folks, if we've been bringing in the half a million a year, that pretty much says a million a year? I, I don't know. I'm just saying. God has really encouraged me with other people coming and saying, here's what the Lord has said to me uh, for you. And so, uh, so I want to share with you just briefly uh, a few testimonies about uh, what has happened with the yellow book and how God has used it. Okay? Uh, i I left Westwood Baptist Church in September of 04, and the book came out in January of 03. And uh, anyway, uh, I, I was new at this and didn't have many places to go. And I'm sitting at the house one day praying, and the Lord uh, uh, opened some doors for me. And while I'm praying, my phone rings, and I was praying specifically about a place called Andalusia, Alabama. Uh, because I'd sent like some cases of books down there to an association and they were getting them out of the hands of churches. And so I said, Lord, we sent a lot of books down there. Would you open the door for me? So while I'm praying, my phone rings. There's a pastor from Antidote, Alabama. And he says, I need some more books. We've got talking. So he invites me to come to his church and share the material in, in May of the next year, which would have been, been, uh, been 05. Uh, I take that back. That was March of the next year. Well, another pastor called me. He wanted me to come in January. Pastor in Louisiana, I came and talked to material. And so anyway, uh, the guy told me, he said, tomorrow, Monday, we're going down to Andalusia, Alabama, me and a preacher friend of mine. And he said, uh, they've got a 77-year-old man down there they've been praying for for years, hadn't got saved. So we're going to pray these principles on the way down there, about, probably about a four-hour, five-hour drive. And uh, so that's what they did. Well, the first thing they do when they get to Andalusia, they go to this guy's house. His name is Harry Peacock. And... Uh, <laughs> And they win Harry Peacock to the Lord. He gets gloriously saved. But folks, listen, Harry Peacock was one of the original Green Berets. And I found this out later. He was the Rambo of his day. If they needed somebody to be killed, they sent Harry Peacock to do it. He could kill you with his hands. He could kill, kill you with a knife. He could kill you with a gun. He could kill you in ways you couldn't even think of. He was the man they sent to kill people. And the devil had him convinced he couldn't be saved because he'd, he'd kill people. And so listen to this. My friend David Duke, that was the pastor who I shared the material, he opened his, up his Bible to Romans chapter 13, which talks about authority. And he said, listen, Harry, uh, you were doing what the government told you to do. You were under the authority of the United States government. You wasn't doing it on your own. You were under authority. You were obeying orders. And folks, when he realized he was under authority, bam, that stronghold broke. He got gloriously saved. Well, David Duke told his uh, pastor friend that went with him, who was the pastor out here at Reeves, and uh, he said, you're going to do yourself and your church a disservice if you don't get Lee come share the material. So he called me and wanted me to come, and I came in May, and this was in 2005. I shared the material, and he told me the rest of the story. He said, Lee, I had been in Andalusia the week before. The last thing I did is I went by Harry's house one more time to witness to him. I've been witness to him for years, praying for him for years, and couldn't win him to Christ. But folks, after they learned how to pray effectively, he got saved just like that. And here's an here's a added bonus to this. When I shared that material in Reeves Church in May of 2005, April Donahue got saved. <laughs> As a result of the yellow book. And she told me I could tell the story. And then she prayed for her husband, he got saved. So, I mean, God, God just does some incredible stuff 
There was a lady in Kansas City. I was there a few years ago, a large church. She said, Brother Lee, I need to tell you my story. She said, I've got two sons. I prayed for them for years and years and years. Didn't see any, anything happen. Somebody gave me this yellow book. She said, I read it four times and realized I wasn't praying right. She said, now I've read it 60 times, and she's on the street evangelism team. And she said, I read it four times, started praying the principles. She said, within, within three weeks, both my sons called me and told me they got saved. One of them, she said, was a drug pusher. That's all they'd ever done. One time he had to leave town, she said, because another drug pusher hit a hit, put a hit out on him. And then, she said, now at the age of 40, he has his first legal job. It just works. I was in a church here in North Louisiana. I shared this material. The pastor called me two weeks later on a Monday. I'll never forget it. He said, Brother Lee, after you hear what he said, we pray for the meanest man in our town. Everybody knew who he was. The church started praying for the meanest man in town. He said he came to church yesterday, walked down the aisle. He was broken. He got saved. He said, Preacher, this is the first time I've smiled in 20 years. But when you get serious about praying for lost people, they'll, they'll get saved. I was in another church in North Louisiana. I shared this material. A young lady there in her early 20s emailed me about three weeks later. She said, Brother Lee, my brother was a drug addict. I thought he was going to die. He was in such bad shape. She said, I prayed these principles. He got saved almost immediately. His girlfriend was a drug addict. I prayed for her. She got saved. Then she said, the girlfriend's mother, grandmother was a witch, and she was trying to keep her daughter from coming out of the drug culture. And she said, I prayed for the witch, and she got saved the very hour I prayed for her. Two drug addicts and witch got saved, folks, within three weeks because somebody prayed the principles. I was in the church in Kentucky on a Monday night. I shared this material. There was a young man there going to the seminary in, in Louisville, Southern Baptist Seminary. His mom and dad were both lost, and they lived in Florida. They didn't really want much to do with him after he surrendered to preach. He went home that night and prayed the principles. His dad got saved the next morning. I was in West Virginia doing meetings. Three weeks later, a pastor called me. He said, Brother Lee, I heard you speak uh, at the high school, auditorium, in the high school auditorium there. And she, he said, uh, I've been praying these principles. He said, I've had 18 people get saved since you were here. Three weeks. He said, one man, I was talking to him about the Lord. And, and uh, while uh, he was saying something to me, he said, I just, I just silently prayed. And I said, Lord, what's his problem? Because you see and pray for lost people, there's always one issue that blinds them to the truth of the gospel. He said, all of a sudden, this guy looked at him. He said, you want what my problem is? <laughs> and just like that, he told him what the issue was that stood between him and God. I was in a church here in Louisiana some time ago. I shared this material. Uh, the pastor encouraged people to write down names of lost people. They had about 100 people on their list. Folks, in the next three months, he baptized 21 people. It was a little country church out in the woods. All 21 were on the prayer list. I was in a church out in Iowa. A few years ago, several years ago now, I shared this material. There was a lady there, 56 years old. Uh, she told her daughter one day, she heard me share this material. And uh, she told her daughter one day, she said, when I die, I want you to have an altar call at my funeral. She's 56 years old. But every Sunday, she'd stand up in the church, a little small church. Probably wouldn't hold as many people as in this one, one side right here. And she said, uh, please have me pray for my family members. Then she would name them. She did this every Sunday morning. She'd get up and say, please have me pray for my family members. She named them. Four months after I was there, folks, she suddenly died. The daughter told the pastor she wanted to have an altar call at her funeral. He preached a funeral in a funeral home in Jennings, Louisiana, gave an altar call, and folks, 18 of her family members got up out of their seat, came down front, prayed to receive Christ as Lord and Savior. And folks, it just goes on and on and on. Real quickly, the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 and 19. Uh, here's what he says. I'm going to just summarize it right quick. You can go home and read it later for yourself. But here's what it says. Uh, go into all nations. Teach all nations. Folks, the Greek word for nations is ethnos, eth ethnic groups. This to me, there are 17,428 uh, ethnic groups in the world. And the main thing is, is the language, okay? 7,400 of them are considered unreached. An unreached people group is a group that has 2% or less evangelical Christians. There's not enough of them to evangelize the country, so they, so they need help. But listen to this. I researched the 50 main people groups, the most people in them. And this little yellow book has been translated, folks, in 26 of those languages out of the 50 major unreached people groups. It's also in, in, in 33 of the uh, 
Uh, well, I said more than that, but we got like 33 printed, but we've got some more. Folks, since, since November of last year, we've had three people give specifically get, get books. We have some people in this church give specifically to get books printed in other languages. But we've had 10 languages printed since November of last year. We've printed 50,000 of the yellow books in the last 11 months. The Philippines, I've been wanting to get in the Philippines. Somebody down there liked the book, and I don't know if it was a Christian businessman or a Christian organization. They said, hey, if you'll get as many as 5,000 printed, we'll pay half. So we only had to pay half of 5,000 we'd printed in the Philippines. It's just, it's just incredible for what, what God has done and, and is doing. Now, one last thing, and I want to say this. Uh, I want to talk about how you can have your legacy. Luke chapter 8. Can you go ahead and pull that up for us? Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Now, it says, uh, it came to pass that after Jesus, talk about Jesus, he went through every city and village, preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And certain women, watch this, this is interesting to me, folks, I think if it hadn't been for women through the years, mission work probably wouldn't have gotten done. Certain women which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod Steward, and Susanna, and many others ministered unto him of their substance. That means some of these well-known ladies, some of them well-to-do ladies, some of them have been saved through his ministry, and many others ministered to him with their substance. That means their finances, their money, what they had to live on. Many of them. Many of them did it. Now, here's why you can really get involved. If you don't feel comfortable witnessing somebody, you can help us do what we do. See? Rick Newman. I met Rick Newman in 2004. Bill, my friend, Kevin, introduced me to him. And Bill had a, uh, I mean, Rick had a, a, a business where he refurbished tractors and all kind of equipment and, and uh, didn't look like much of a business. He, at that time, he was sharing his office with one man that worked for him. He had like a, a portable divider. I went in and Bill told me, well, I got this to tell, tell Rick your burden. Well, my burden was, God said, when I wrote the book, I want to hand some millions of people. And I just told him my burden. He pulled out his checkbook, wrote a check, slid it across the table to me, and it was a check for uh, $20,000. I'd never seen a check that big. I just started crying. <laughs> we got a bunch of books published, with, printed with that $20,000. But listen to this. Rick called, called before the day was over. He was crying over the phone. He said, I made $140,000 today. That day. Not that week or month. That day he made $140,000. Folks, God restored his money sevenfold in the same day. I was, Bill, again, he was on our board. Uh, he wanted me to meet with a couple in Ohio and have lunch with them because they were really struggling, had a ministry. I went and had lunch with them. Both of them kind of broke down and cried while I was there. They, they had a good ministry, but they were just struggling financially. I got home. It was a week of Thanksgiving. I got home on a Monday. I told Andy, I said, God impressed the moment to send them a, a check for $2,000 for this ministry. And folks, at that time, this was back in uh, 2010, I believe. Uh, at that time, we were scraping the bottom of the barrel. We didn't have $2,000 to use. You understand what I'm saying? She wrote the check, I think reluctantly, <laughs> put it in the mail. The next day, I had a friend that we went to high school together, and we went to college together, taking the same courses. We were best of friends. He was the best man at my wedding. I married him and his wife. We would duck hunt together and all that kind of stuff. Had most of all the same classes together. Hadn't seen him in 30 years. I didn't know where he'd gone to. He didn't know where I'd gotten off to. But he'd gotten a copy of the book in a church in Texas, close to where he lives. He saw my name. I thought that must be me. He called, found out it was. So I was in Kentucky when he called. And so uh, we... He, he decided they'd come on Tuesday, the day after I got back to Kentucky. We wrote a $2,000 check on Monday. Tuesday, Charlie and his wife comes. We go have lunch together. We visit a while. They get in a vehicle to leave, and they just sit there. They don't leave. After a few minutes, Charlie gets back out of, the, out of his vehicle. He walks up to the door, and he said, uh, 
And they all told me we couldn't leave until we gave you something, something for the ministry. He handed me a check for $20,000. We gave nearly everything we had the day before, 2000 That's all we had. And the next day, God sent us 20000 Well, you, you can't outgive God. You, you, you just can't do that. Now, listen to me closely. There's a thing today called blue chip stock. If you had somebody you really believed in and really trusted, if they had come to you many years ago and said, hey, like this, is, this guy named Bill Gates is uh, coming up with a thing that's uh, Microsoft Works. It's probably going, well, I know it's going to be make millions of dollars. If you invest in it, you'll be a multimillionaire. If somebody told you that and you really believed them, you would have gone to the bank to borrow money to invest in Bill Gates' stock. Because everybody's dead multimillionaires today. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Go ahead and pull up our, our, our next verses here. Pull up John chapter 4. Jesus said to them, My meat is do the will of him that sent me uh, and finish his work. This was at the well of Sychar. Okay, go ahead. He said, Say not ye there yet four months, and then comes the harvest. I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields. They're white already to harvest. Folks, listen to me. Over 63 million people will die this year. Missionaries who work in, in countries where things are really tough, they estimate only 10 to 11% know the Lord. That means about 56 or 57 million people will die and go to hell this year. That's over a million a week. All right? Let's go ahead. And he that reaps receiveth wages and gathers fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. But listen to me, the sower and the reaper is one and the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, go ahead and pull that up for us. I want you to see this. This is, this is great. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are what? One. I may plant, you may water. Guess what? We're one. We're one machine in God's work. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. So watch this. Every man shall receive his own reward reward for his own labor depending on what you do you may wit be witnessing that be your labor uh, you may be giving that might be your later labor you may be praying that might be your labor but you're going to be rewarded for the labor that you do individually when you get to heaven folks you're going to have your own legacy not somebody else's and nobody else is going to share yours it's going to all be the same so here's what i want you to see all these women gave to Jesus' ministry. He had not only himself, but 12 other men and their families to provide for because they left their jobs to follow him. So let me tell you what, folk. I may have written a book. But God wrote it, but he used my hands to do it. But if you help us financially to get books printed, what good is the book? What, what good is it going to do here, folk? If we just have one book laying here, how is it going to help people all over the world? We've got to have help doing that. And here's what I figured, according to what the prophet told me up in West Virginia. For every $3 that come into our ministry, I mean, for every dollar, three people get saved. For every dollar that comes to our ministry, three people get saved somewhere in the world, according to the statistics. And it may be doubling now because God spoke through Eric and said, you have a double harvest for the next 10 years. It may be six people getting saved for a dollar now. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, if you'd like to see souls get saved, one of the, I'm not begging you for money, I'm just telling you. If you want to be involved in a ministry that's seeing souls get saved and you want to build your own legacy, you have to get involved in it. And I pray that you will. It'd be a wonderful thing if every family in this church supported us on, on a regular basis. Miss May Roy has given, been giving us a check to our ministry from the very beginning. I'm talking about 18 years. She gives every month to our ministry. Has been doing it for 18 years. And we've got others that's been given. We've got a family here that gave just to get books printed in other languages. Probably six or seven thousand people getting saved because of what they gave. It's your legacy. 
I believe God put me here on this earth for one reason. That's to write this yellow book. If I don't do anything else, folk, I've already done what God's called me to do. Of course, I hope to stay busy, but I'm just telling you, when I'm dead and gone, this book's going to still be going out. And I hope Andy takes over and makes sure the books get printed in every language we can. Folks, I'm praying, I'm praying for 100 million souls to be saved. And I believe it's going to happen. You want to join me? It's your legacy, not mine.